The purpose of this video is to show how to use the LiDAR Building Extraction Tool. This tool was developed at the Earth Data Analysis Center at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, New Mexico, thanks to funding from FEMA Region 6. In recent years, LiDAR mapping, or laser mapping as it's otherwise known as, has become much more available. In this graphic uh, from the USGS, circa about January 2018, you see everything in green where there's areas that have been covered by large-scale LiDAR mapping projects. This data provides uh, one meter spatial resolution digital elevation models, as you can see to the left. This compares favorably to what we see on the right, which is uh, the old digital elevation model. The elevation data here provides a lot better um, capabilities, including uh, better slope maps, maybe better aspect maps, contours, a whole realm of different kinds of uh, data products that uh, have now become available to the user here. Um, but not only is there just the LiDAR data, as in, in the form of a digital elevation model, but you also have the point cloud data. And the point cloud data maps not only the um, surface information, but also the above surface information. This is, comes from the actual process of the LiDAR pulse hitting the ground or hitting anything else that, that it comes in contact with. So when it hits, comes back and is recorded on the LiDAR device, it records uh, not only the X, Y, Z value, but also the intensity, how strong the uh, value was. Uh, the return number. When it hits a soft object, there's multiple returns that can happen. If it hits a hard object, it's usually just one return. But um, each uh, pulse that uh, splashes back to the sensor is recorded with a certain return number, as well as it provides um, information here with um, the most recent LiDAR type data, what we call LAS data or dot LAS dot LAS type of data sets, where you have a each point can be also classified. Classifications can run a gamut of different kinds of things. Usually the data sets that get delivered in most product deliveries only provide a unclassified, a ground, a water, and bridge deck classification. That then provides a whole lot of um, other information, surface information that is available in the point cloud that is kind of put into the unclassified area. Theoretically, getting at the building information within that LiDAR cloud shouldn't be too difficult because as mentioned before, surfaces that are soft like vegetation have multiple responses, multiple returns, but buildings are hard targets and should have just a single return. So you should just be able to sort out all the unclassified data that has just a single return and you should have your building information. But in this example, we see uh, in this area here where we took the information from the LiDAR point cloud and just sorted out all unclassified data that had a uh, single return. And you see the buildings there, but you also see a lot of uh, other clutter, which is essentially the vegetation. Here's an oblique image of that same area. And again, you can see a lot of vegetation as well as a lot of buildings. This is probably due to the fact that uh, within the plants, there are also a lot of hard objects there, such as branches and trunks and stems, which if they don't intersect with any other tree or the, any other part of the tree, then turns into just one response back. So here comes uh, the issue here where we had to develop a, a tool to help sort out all the vegetation noise and other things from the actual building tool. So we created a tool to help process the LiDAR data as it is in the last files, the uh, LAS files, version 1.4, in an ESRI environment. Uh, primarily, we developed this tool on ARC map uh, 10.5, version 10.5. It can work on 10.4. We've tested it there, and also ARC Pro. But for the purposes of this video, we're going to primarily be using 10.5 as our base here. One of the important things you need to know is that uh, in order for it to work, it needs 3D analyst and spatial analyst. You need to turn those on in your extensions. And then you just need to go and get the uh, tool. So we have it both available on the NM Flood website as well as uh, our GitHub website. That's uh, https 
colon slash slash github.com slash edac. And here we'll go down. There's a few other tools here, but the one you're interested in is the building extraction toolbox. Click on that and we'll just say download. Download zip. Say OK. And so that should be available in your download uh, directory. Once you've got it downloaded, you can go put it in whatever directory you think uh, you need to put it in there and then go to that directory and you see here let me repeat that again in case i went too fast on that part there but you click on the arc toolbox right click hold and you see the add toolbox uh, script there you go to the add toolbox dialog box here and here i've already got it browsed to the right place here. So I click on the uh, building extraction toolbox, say open. And you see it's just added the building toolbox to my arc toolbox set here. And with all the different kinds of things, we have a step one, step 2a, and step 2b. Step one is where we begin with. Step 2a and step 2b are alternative different uh, choices you have to, to process the data further. But first, another thing I need to mention here is that the last files and the DEM tiles should have the exact uh, same prefix. Again, here's an example where I have a last directory all set up with all the last files here, uh, with all these long prefix here. Then I have a, the bare earth DEM set up in another folder here. And again, they have the exact same uh, prefix here. So it's important that both of these have the exact same prefix. So now you should be ready to use the tool and process the data. You've loaded up the, the tool in the Arc Toolbox. You've gone to your customized extensions and made sure that you have 3D Analyst and it's turned on. You've got your LAS version 1.4 files in one directory. And you've got the DEM, bare DEM tiles in another directory with all with the same prefix. So you now can click on step one and we'll begin the building object extraction. And the first part's pretty straightforward. You point it to where the last input directories are. You show where that is. You go to the DEM, show where all the DEMs are. And then you point it to a place where you have an out point, output to directory. Um, well, it will do when it does the processing, it will actually create a number of files. We've tried to streamline it so it doesn't output as many as it actually goes through there. But it will put all the, the data products into the output directory and actually into a timestamp uh, folder. With the theory being that uh, you can run multiple runs here and it will put in separate timestamp uh, folders. So the first part is fairly straightforward. Next thing we'll go to here is the last data set to raster parameters here. What this does is tell the tool how you want to develop the image data that can be developed from the last data. So what happens is with this process, it'll take a look at your last files. It'll ingest it into what Esri calls a last data set file folder or a LASD data set. And it takes those and then sorts out from all the last files everything that is unclassified and all the last returns. Again, and what we're looking for are the building objects. So we're looking for everything that has either a one return or is at the bottom of a, like a tree response there. And so what we've said is uh, get, show us everywhere where everything is a single return and show us everywhere where the, the, the bottom return comes back and comes back and develops an image on the elevations based on that last return data set. Now when it goes through this, it, you have multiple different ways of developing these digital surface models, these images. You can create all sorts of different images actually. These are all based on ARC tools. And so we've tried as much as possible to preserve all the utility of that, even though most of this is not going to be required for this uh, processing the buildings. But you can do your own experimentation and play with these, some of these other variables. But our defaults here is to take a look at the last data set and use only the elevation information. 
Again, you can use other, you can create an intensity image you want. That's not useful for this purposes, but you could ultimately use this to create an intensity image. Um, then we create the digital surface model. We tell it uh, that if it finds a point to pull back a elevation data, the elevation data from that to create the digital surface model. If it doesn't find a point in this, this certain area, then we respond with no, no data. So we just are interested in areas where there's potentially a building and everything else we want to turn off. So we have the, we tell it to just look at uh, the, the places within a certain square area that it has actual response. If it has no response, just give us none. Now you have all sorts of other variabilities that you can, or parameters that you can use here to model through there. But uh, for this purpose, we're just selecting this one here. The DSM, the digital surface model, we're saying should be a floating point. Again, this preserves um, uh, the meters and the or um, fractional feet or fractional meters in information. If you turn this into integer, which you have the possibility to, you only get straight meters or straight feet, depending on what the elevation data is in. And that could truncate a lot of your information. So even though it makes the data set that much larger, we preserve the, the floating points that we can have access to, you know, like one meter or 30 centimeters, and that such data there. Uh, to create the digital surface model, we say that we want cells out there, and there's another different option, but we're, we're look at everything within a certain cell. And the cell is defined by the what's considered the ground sampling resolution here. In this case, uh, a standard product for quality level 2 LiDAR data is uh, 1 meter spatial resolution, so we go gone ahead and put in 1 as the default. Uh, if you have other data sets, you can change that. And again, this is based on the spatial, res spatial resolution and the spatial units here. So if you have feet data and you have like quality level two uh, state plane feet data, then you probably want to change this to two or three. So you're modeling like a two square foot or three square foot. Again, we're in this case, generally we've seen a lot of uh, UTM meter type of uh, projection information, and so we default to a one meter spatial resolution. So this will output put, uh, digital surface models with grids of one square meter. So with all this information, it will take the, the last point cloud, process it into a data set, and then turn it into a digital surface model representing all the uh, single return or last return data and put that into a digital surface model. At that point in time, the digital surface model is just an elevation file. But what we then do is we take the elevation file and subtract it from the actual bare earth DEM tiles. And from that, we get a height DSM. So basically, how far above ground are each of these objects that we, we are mapping here. So we end up uh, then with a DSM, that's just, just purely a height DSM, again, in elevation units, whatever your elevation, the original elevation units are. In this case, it's meters for this data set, but in other ones, it could be feet or whatever other things. Now, that means that we still end up with a lot of noise, uh, like especially shrubs and things, uh, anything that's above ground, not uh, pure uh, bare ground. So what we do is tr we try to thresh out out the, the data by turning off everything that's below a certain height, realizing that buildings tend to have a, a certain minimum rooftop height. And uh, so we put that in here. And what this does in this case, again, this is a data set, well, most data sets we've dealt with tend to be in UTM meters. The elevations are in meters too. We say that everything that's two meters or above, we will keep, but everything below two meters, we will turn off, make it no data. Now, again, if your data set is in feet, you'll have to change that appropriately. And if you have other different criteria where you're, you're building heights, you want to either make them either smaller or taller, you can, you can change it here. The last thing in the building ex object extractor tool set here is the image segmentation. 
So we've developed this height DSM and we've uh, thresholded everything out that was uh, below a certain height. So now we're left with just objects that are a certain height or above. Again, we will still have a lot of uh, trees and other kinds of objects as well as the buildings. So what we do is we put the data set through what we call image segmentation. It's a little bit more complex to explain, but what it does is it tries to find within the raster object places where the context is dissimilar, and then it makes a break and says, okay, we have two separate different raster objects. It's kind of a classification. It turns basically the raster data to a bunch of raster-based polygons, where everything that's similar in one respect, it gets one kind of class, and another class for the next one, another class for the next one. So with this, we're hoping that we take away, take apart uh, flat roofs from maybe adjoining trees and other kinds of objects. We're figuring that the, the trees have different uh, kinds of object information as well as the, the, the flat roofs. So we're basically creating classification of these objects here. And uh, the image segmentation process requires certain different uh, uh, parameters to be filled out. One is spectral detail and similarly we have the spatial detail. Uh, again, very kind of difficult to, to kind of explain. These are more hand wavy type concepts, but the idea here is that if there's a lot of contextual change, uh, the spatial detail will will pull that out. If there's not a whole lot, uh, then it won't pull it out. Uh, spectral detail means that uh, there's a big change in the, the, the values. Um, again, you can have multi-band image to put in here, but in this case, we just have one band, which is the elevation data. And so we're just looking at kind of, um, kind of certain abrupt changes in elevation. We've set up uh, the default for spectral detail being 15.5 and spatial detail to be 15. These are values from 1 to 20. Again, if you're not satisfied with some of the outputs you're having here, this may be a place where you may want to change. If you're finding that you have way too much uh, in detail, way too many objects being classified out, then you want to lower the spatial detail or the spectral detail. Maybe make them 10 or 5 or something. If you're finding that you're not getting enough of the data being pulled out, not, not enough detail, then you want to increase that. Again, maximum you can go to is 20 for each of these. So that's what these two are. Again, it's kind of, uh, you have to kind of play that um, um, as it goes there, but we have found it pretty successful that we were pretty successful with the, uh, these numbers here. The last thing that gets input into the image segmentation process is the minimum segment size. Here you see the value 10, and what that says is that it tries to exclude everything that's kind of small clutter out of the area there. So it says anything below 10 cells, again in this case the cells are we set up for one square meter down here. So we're saying that anything that's a, a clusters as to 10 square meters or larger, we will keep. But anything that's smaller than 10 square meters, we'll toss out. So you'll take this and kind of sort through the data and hopefully classify out all the objects to provide uh, a, a raster-based classification where uh, the rooftops should be separated as separate classes from all of the trees. And that ends uh, this thing. You just once all that information is filled out, you can hit OK, and you're done with that process. So now I've processed a number of last tiles uh, using the building object extractor tool here, the step one that we discussed about earlier. And we will go ahead and take a look at some of the results. How long does this take? Uh, there's not a real good definitive answer on this. It all depends on the complexity of the uh, last data. Uh, if you have a flat area with very few buildings, it could take a couple of minutes to process. If you've got an area with a whole bunch of trees and buildings, it could take, you know, I don't know, up to an hour. Uh, I processed uh, 32 tiles over this area. Um, you can kind of see the level of complexity that you see here with the buildings and the, the trees and everything. And it took approximately about uh, 10 uh, minutes per tile. These are square mile tiles. So again, it just kind of vary. I would highly suggest that you go through and do a 
a triage through uh, all your last tiles, maybe with an air photo as a backdrop, and figure out which tiles you don't need. Uh, so that'll just cut down the amount of time devoted to this thing. So just pull out the, the tiles that seem to have buildings in it and go from there. So we're going to take this now and take a look at some of the data products that were developed after the finish of, of step one. First thing that happened was, uh, as we talked about before, it creates these last data sets. Again, these are an Esri product that uh, likes to house the um, um, the last data files here. Uh, this is just about four different tiles. Uh, they kind of intersect right about here in this area. Um, and again, they have all sorts of different kinds of information, the elevation, returns, all sorts of things. It's not a... Uh, LiDAR last uh, training video here. We're just talking about the building tools, so I won't go through all that. But these are last data sets, so you can take these and do other kinds of processing. Uh, but right now, uh, what I've got here is actually the, the point cloud express uh, according to their classification. And everything, all the points that are classified as ground or the, this brown color here, and everything, all the points that are unclassified are gray, and then like no areas are kind of white here. So it kind of shows you you know, what we're dealing with here. Basically, we're going to be sorting out everything that's in the gray and, and dealing with that. So that's the uh, last data sets. Then with those last data sets, as we talked about, we create um, these height DSMs. Again, we first create a, an elevation DSM based on the unclassified last return. And then we subtract that out from the uh, regular bare earth DEM to get these height DSMs. Again, these are heights above ground in whatever elevation units you're using. In this case, it was meters, but can be feet. And also at the very end, we, we said that, you know, we want to kind of threshold out all the, the little clutter like shrubs and other things. So we said everything two meters and above we're going to keep, we're going to turn off everything else. So here you see uh, the data set here with uh, all the different, uh, what was brought through in the very end. I'll turn off the background so you have a better idea. You can kind of see that, you know, very obvious where all the buildings are here, but there's also an awful lot of clutter from the vegetation and a few other things here. So this is the height DSM. Again, you can use this in the future for other kinds of products, but you've got this there. And then at the very end, you create these image segmentation products. Again, I'll throw the uh, DLQ in the background again, just to kind of uh, compare uh, what was underneath there. If that's a little too busy, I'll turn it back off again. But uh, so each of these are individual objects. And so this, as I was explained before, it's like a polygon, but these are rasters. So, but apparently if you um, pick anywhere along here, it'll say, okay, this is one polygon, that's a raster. And then you pick here, this will be a, another separate one. Each of these have a separate class code to them. So that way you can, can sort out this versus all these other little classes here, which are now you know, obviously vegetation. So that's basically what we're, um, the end product of the last uh, step was to develop these raster objects. But we did one more thing here with the tool. Um, we um, went ahead and collected the roof height variability. If you t take a look at the uh, roofs, they tend to have very little variability as you move along from you know, one side to the other. And they may either increase or decrease or stay flat, but there's just not a whole lot of overall variability. Whereas again, if you and you see that here, where the low variability, or in this case, low standard deviation values are being displayed in brown or orange, these colors there. But high variability or high standard deviation values in this case are being displayed in greens and blues. And again, this is what you would expect. Canopy has all sorts of different kinds of height values. So it has a, it's a high varied uh, standard deviation in, in height each of these um, class objects would have. So you're, you're seeing this, so this, again, this color range from uh, the, the oranges and browns being the, the lowest uh, value to these greens and blues being the highest value. And I can pick on one here and kind of show you. Okay, this has a pixel value, which is a standard deviation value of 0.748. Uh, um, for, and that's for this whole roof area here. Now we're to pick over into like a, a tree area here. I'll pick over here. 
has a value of 3.53. So you can kind of see that, uh, again, in general, not always the case, there's always exceptions, uh, because elsewise it would just be too easy. But um, everything or things that have high standard deviation tend to be trees or other kinds of vegetation, and things with low standard deviation, standard deviations tend to be roofs. So we're going to use this in the next uh, tool here to help uh, filter out the vegetation then just to show you that. Now what you can do again, as I said, you can go into the arc symbology and color code these to help maybe parse out, you know, what, you know, get some, some idea of what some sort of threshold there is between vegetation and buildings. Or again, you can use the, the identity tool and, and take a look and see what you're getting that way too. Um, but what we have generally found is that uh, when we uh, have done this in the past, uh, values, uh, standard deviation values of 1.5 and higher tend to be more trees. Less than 1.5 tends to be buildings. Um, again, there still be some vegetation on the either on the the lower side and buildings on the higher side, but that tends to be kind of a good line to uh, filter these things out. Again, if you're having problems with too many buildings being put uh, uh, massed out or too many too much vegetation being uh, pulled through this is be a place for you to maybe take a look at and and see if you want to use that use the standard deviation to, to work now as i said before we have uh, two steps here the standard de standard deviation building filter or the standard deviation and ndvi or normalized difference vegetation index building filter these are two different building filters the end products of these are going to be your actual building footprints but um, the reason we have two of these is because if you just have the LiDAR data to work with, then you, you'll want to go to step 2A, and this uses the information that is inherent within the um, LiDAR data set. Now, if you're lucky enough to have like a air photo or some other imagery that was acquired at about the same time as the LiDAR data and at about the same spatial resolution, and it has a near infrared and a red bandwidth, then you could create a normal de normalized difference vegetation index. This is a, a image which bas basically enhances uh, uh, vegetative vigor. And um, we'll go a little bit into that. But if you don't have a, an image of the same time, same resolution, that has a in, uh, near infrared and the red, then um, you're, you, the only step you can go to is this next step here, step 2A. So we'll go into that right now. Discuss step 2B um, later here. So step 2A, the standard deviation building filter, it works very similar to what we've seen before. Input directory, again, this is going to be in your that output file. It's going to take that uh, these objects here and go ahead and filter these objects. So you want to point this towards your output file. And actually, you need to go in the output file to the timestamp file. Now, a common error here, which I've done enough times, is it'll go, you know, I'll point to the output file and say, I, I can't find any data. And that's just because I need to go needed to go inside the output file to the timestamp file and say, that's where the data lie. And then create an output directory. Again, you could use the output directory from before, but I, and we do have a timestamp file, so there shouldn't be any confusion. But I always kind of like to keep things separate just to make sure that I know where the problems may exist here. So I would highly suggest creating a whole new output file for this. And again, what this will result in is the output directory will house the actual building footprints. The threshold here that you see here, so we were talking about before, the standard deviation threshold. So values of, in this case, above 1.5 will be turned into no data, considered vegetation, and, and turned off. Everything below that will be considered buildings and kept there. Footprint size threshold, this is another way that we used to help uh, sort out all of the clutter here. And again, the idea that these buildings should be at least a certain size. In this case, we've got we're generally using UTM meters, so we we've chosen uh, 32 square meters as kind of our minimum size footprint. Everything bigger than that will be kept. Anything smaller than that would be considered more noise, uh, you know, a little still more vegetation. Another vegetation filter, or maybe large trucks and things like that. So it gets rid of some of that information there. If it's uh, if you have state plane feed again, you'll have to convert this to uh, something that you're more willing to use, like 300 square feet or 400 square feet or whatever you want to use to help uh, pull out your buildings there.
This actually also goes through another image segmentation process uh, to help uh, filter out uh, this data sets uh, uh, based on the standard deviation values. This image segmentation, again, works like the previous one. And uh, again, if you looked at your data file before and you're finding that uh, you had perfectly good objects and now they're getting all tossed out, this may be a place for you to play with. Um, the idea that if you're having far too many objects, you, you want to push down the, the values, you're having not enough objects, you can push up there. Again, we always have the minimum segment size. As I said before, this works very much like what happened in step one. The last thing here, and this is another little neat odd feature that ARC has, which has uh, been really nice. Um, what you end up with the, in the final results here is you'll end up with polygons that are based off of rasterized objects. And the problem with the rasterized objects is you'll end up with all these jagged edges, which uh, when you look up close kind of are fairly annoying. So uh, Esri in, has this regular, regularized building footprint, which is a way to kind of shear off the, the jagged edges and clean up little holes and things that are found uh, throughout uh, the, the object there. Now there's, um, it has several different uh, variables to choose from. We have as default uh, right angles. This is really good for kind of doing perpendicular long straight edges. Uh, if you're, just definitely if you have uh, buildings that are east, west, north, south gridded, uh, this is a, a great tool to use that way. As in the case that I have here, I do have problems with the fact that a lot of my buildings are all sorts of odd shapes and definitely rarely on a north, south, east, west grid. So I, I end up with a few more problems because of that. But even with that, the right angle seems to work fairly nicely. If you're having issues and you really don't like the output there, you go to right angles and diagonals. This kind of compensates for allowing a lot more diagonal edges than just straight right angles. I've not been too happy with the products on those things, but you can see if that works better for you. Any angle just uh, doesn't enforce any kind of perpendicular perpendicularity. And uh, again, you've really got odd shaped buildings, but I've, again, I've not been very happy with the output on those things. So that's, uh, I tend to stay in the right angles. Again, a problem with the right, right angles, if you don't have a straight east, west, north, south, you have something diagonal, it'll start making um, little jagged, uh, it'll try to enforce perpendicularity to that. And you end up with uh, like these little stair step edges, which you can play around with and see if you can deal with or not deal with there. Another issue, they also have a circle uh, variable here. If you, what you find with the right angle uh, uh, method is that it'll turn any kind of uh, round feature like a tank or water tank or some other kind of uh, round object into something that looks like a first aid cross with um, uh, you know kind of a squared off a circle version. If you have a lot of circles, um, you may want to use this, you, like you're going over a tank farm or some other area with a lot of round things. Elsewise, I always I suggest right angles. And then the last two uh, variables, the tolerance and densification, are you know, primarily used by right angles, uh, but also some of the other methods. And this is a way to tell it, you know, at what point uh, do you start looking for another bend in the uh, the angle, or do you well, how, how far do you enforce a, a right angle or perpendicularity to this? And at what point do you get rid of some of the holes that are kind of along the edges and in interior in the, the object here? These are done in the spatial units of, uh, of whatever your horizontal uh, uh, system is. Uh, again, we have, in this case, uh, meters. So these are saying it's looking for anything greater than two meters or anything that, that it'll start doing, imposing different kinds of uh, angles on. Anything less, it'll try to keep it straight or get rid of holes. After you fill that all in, you can um, set OK and send it off there. So now about the other tool, step 2b, the standard deviation and NDVI building filter tool here. Again, this is uh, what you can use if you are lucky enough to have an NDVI. Again, let me show you what I'm t talking about a little bit. Um, turn off our previous uh, background here and uh, turn on the Airphoto, 
And again, this is an aerial photo that happened at the, about the same time as the LiDAR image. It's a one meter data set, so it functions both ways. It's a, it, uh, it was time concurrent with the LiDAR data set. It's about the same spatial resolution, and it did have a red and a visible red and a near infrared bandwidth. So from that, I was able to create an NDBI image. You can see that here. Again, I've kind of color coded. This usually comes out as a black and white image, but I've color coded it so like uh, uh, low NDVI values here. Um, let's see, or you know, 99 in this case. I'll go a little bit more into that. So that's kind of the barren areas, and you get into the more vegetated areas, and they have values of 154. Now, um, in the guide, I talk a little bit about how I develop uh, NDVIs personally. Um, the Pure normalized difference vegetation index uh, is usually done as kind of a difference ratio over a sum of the near infrared and the red. And that ends up with values that range from negative one, fractional values from negative one to positive one, with values below zero being definitely barren in water, and values um, uh, towards the positive one becoming more and more vegetated. Now, I don't like personally having a fractional signed data set there, so I try to get rid of that. And so I add a, a extra little thing where I add one to make it all positive numbers and then multiply by 100 so I can turn it into an integer image that goes from zero to 200 essentially, with the value of 100 being the, the inflection point between barren and vegetative type things. And that just makes for a smaller data set and easier to manage uh, using thematic type operations. But uh, if you have a, uh, a tr more traditional NDVI, theoretically you can use that too. Uh, it's, uh, it's just a, should be able to refer to the numbers as, as are. So in this case, again, the inflection point here, as I said, is about 100, and this is saying it's got a value of 99, so it's definitely barren. So, but if I was to go into a um, uh, more vegetated area here. It has a value 153, so like we're, we're approaching 200, so again, greener and greener and greener. So that's the NDVI. So because I have an NDVI, we've added this extra step in the toolbox here, the step 2B, which you can use then. Again, these step 2A and step 2B are not something you do at, uh, both you can either do one or the other. The step 2B not only filters the objects based on their NDVI values, but also on their standard deviation values. So you don't need to go through step 2A if you, you're going here. So I'll click on this. And again, it's very, very similar to what you saw in step 2A here. Input directory, again, it's, it's wanting you to point out where all the image objects are the, in the output folder. And again, let me emphasize uh, to that timestamp folder within the output folder. An output directory, again, create another output directory um, to put this in. You'll create a, a timestamp folder, which you'll put the final products, the same pro final products we were talking about in step 2A, which are the actual building footprints. Threshold, Again, this is a standard deviation threshold. Works just like we were talking about before. You may want to take a look at the uh, building values and uh, the vegetation values and see if you can find a good standard deviation that uh, helps uh, is a good threshold between vegetated areas and non-vegetated areas. But we found in general, at least in our area, that 1.5 seems to be a pretty good uh, threshold value. But you can take a look at that. In this case, what we've now added here are a couple other items here. Uh, we have uh, the NDVI file. Again, the point, this points to the where the actual image is. It's not a folder in this case. It's actually looking for an image. Um, again, it's looking for things that are either images or TIFFs, um, as well as grid files there. And then there's the NDVI threshold. This is similar to the standard deviation threshold, a value of which above is going to consider vegetation. It's going to turn off. Values below, it's going to consider buildings, and it will keep there. In this case, we are seeing 105. With these uh, air photos, seem to work well. We have found that there seems to be an issue, and I think this has to do with uh, a photo-based NDVI versus maybe a more uh, calibrated scanner or some other sensors uh, type of NDVI, in that uh, a lot of there are there are buildings with a certain kind of paint jobs on the roofs that tend to 
have a very high NDVI value. I'm not sure what that is. That doesn't quite work according to the logic of NDVI, but uh, that does exist. And so you may find if you're using the NDVI filter here to help sort out further all the vegetation, it may sort out more things than you care. And so the standard deviation uh, filter step 2a may be a better choice. You'll have to kind of go through and find out there. But you know, there is a does seem to be a certain kind of roof type that seems to come out strong as NDVI, and so you may end up losing those uh, buildings. Okay, some of these other things we've talked about the footprint size threshold again to turn off anything that's small, smaller than certain square footage or square meter, in this case, square meter value again in order to get rid of like shrubs or trucks or other kinds of objects. Image segmentation just like before it goes through the image segmentation to help filter out um, some of the things based on your the thresholds you've de designated and the regularized building footprint again as we discussed before right angles unless you've got some really odd shaped buildings or if you're looking at tank farms and things and again if you have um, you can use this to kind of get rid of, uh, you know, raise these values if you want uh, less uh, jagged type things, but then you may start enforcing really big stair steps. So you kind of have to play your game, play a game with these things. Once you fill all that in, you hit OK and you're ready to go. So now we've sent off the data for its final processing and uh, on either step 2A or step 2B. And uh, we'll now have our outputs to take a look at. So we'll go ahead. I've gone ahead and loaded them up here. And again, these outputs will be found inside your new output file within the timestamp uh, folder in there. And there may be some sundry folder, uh, other files in there. But what you're looking for is the geodata set, the final buildings, geoda final buildings geodata set. And then you can load those up. And so what I'll do right now is look at the, um, right off the bat, the standard deviation filtered products. So here are the building footprints from that. Again, not everything's perfect, but you have a few things here. And get everything separated by their tiles, as it is right now. I'll go and turn off the NDVI and pull back the air photo so you can see where they're covering and what they're doing there. Um, so that's from the standard deviation. Also, I ran it again with step 2b, standard deviation and NDVI, to see what the differences are here. So I'll go ahead and load those up here. So you can kind of take a look at the, the differences between the two. I'll turn off the background so you can better see. So you can kind of see the NDVI kind of helps pull out or mask out a lot more there. That may be good or bad. You'll have to kind of self-assess where you think what works and what doesn't work there. Uh, but uh, now you have these. These are actual building polygons within the geodata base there. And uh, at this point, you can do a number of things. You've got your building uh, polygons here. They're going to probably require a bit of editing still, but hopefully it's much easier than starting with a blank page. So we get you a little bit further down the way here. Um, you'll probably end up with all these tiles at least doing a merge and then maybe dissolve the boundaries so you have like one building instead of like multiple adjoining buildings and then you can do things like uh, once you've done your final edits and you've got a building footprint file that you really like you can do things like uh, drop them on top of the bare earth DEMs to get a base elevation if you're doing like flood information type uh, attributing or you could uh, drop them on top of the height DSM that you created and create a, find out uh, their their average height uh, attributes if you want to assess you know, whether they're one story, two story, or such. Um, you can even take these uh, building files then and drop them back on top of the, um, the last data sets and be able to then uh, color code them or actually classify the, the last data sets according to building classes and then if you want to depending on how good you feel about that you could probably then take the rest of the data set and turn it into to vegetation so uh, a lot of good utilities with this this final product but 
where we've left you here with the building extraction tool still will require a bit more work uh, to finally give you a finished product. But hopefully, again, it helps you in the end uh, speed up uh, the processing. Thank you, and that's all.